back and we're moving into our first conversation for this morning. We are joined by Honorable Patrick Faber, who on Sunday was reaffirmed as the leader of the United Democratic Party. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Marlene. Good morning, Gavin. And uh, good morning to all your viewers, television viewers. Thank you for welcoming me. And of course, let me say good morning to those wonderful people of color who keep electing me every time, five times in a row. Uh, they're a very special set of people to me. Uh, so, good morning, guys and gals from Khaled. <laughs> well, you've had over 24 hours now to have everything sink in um, about being able to secure your position as the leader of this party, um, a goal that you had set for yourself long before you'd put yourself forward for the leadership convention. Uh, tell me what your feeling is like today. Well, it was good that I was reaffirmed, and um, I am very pleased with the results, I will say. While I could have, well, I did certainly wished for more, I wished that um, I could have gotten over the 50%, mm -hmm. understanding that uh, moving beyond the one-third and getting uh, to 226 or whatever it was, was a tremendous feat when the odds are stacked against you. Um, the selection of delegates from way back, uh, in 2019 it would have been uh, not all of those delegates were se selected correctly and um, as a result of that uh, certain things happened along the way ultimately uh, they selected me for leader in July one year ago and so I really could not complain about these delegates going on to the to the uh, the recall convention however it was no secret that I complained vehemently um, about the selection process and it not being done in a proper manner. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you now that uh, primary on my agenda, uh, now that I have been reaffirmed leader of the party, is that we will move to make sure that our constituency organizations, which the delegates are a part of, uh, are strong and properly selected. You know, I've heard this uh, before where you've said that, that the delegate selection is, is kind of stacked against you. But as you rightly noted, in last July, you were able to convince yes. this very group of delegates that you were the best fit leader for the United Democratic Party. So looking at it now, it means that you've lost ground with these delegates. What's, what's uh, the sentiment that you got when you went out on your campaign well, the past if, few weeks? If you understand how they are selected or what problems uh, we encountered in the, in the process of putting delegates in place, firstly, the delegates ought to have been voted in mm -hmm. uh, by their constituencies, the UDPs in those constituencies. Yes. That uh, did not happen in some constituencies. And so it was very easy for one individual or two individuals who led constituencies that were not properly put together to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you will recall that um, the margin, I think, in Sunday's convention was a mere 31 <coughs> votes. And so, in truth, if one constituency had voted in, in a different way, mm -hmm. we would have gotten that, uh, f that 50% and over because a constituency basically has 16 votes. Mm -hmm. So it does not really work out the way you, you proposed it, that um, while uh, some leaders, yes, and in fact, we also saw um, a lowering of the number of participants mm -hmm. while the turnout was significantly high it, compared to other conventions where, in fact, the, the July convention only saw two delegates missing, I think, or one missing and, and one spoilt ballot. Mm -hmm. So uh, even participation-wise, had those additional 38 or so people participated, mm -hmm. I may have well gotten that, um, that over 50%. Yeah. We had one of our delegates who had a baby over the over the time. Yeah. Uh, we had several of our uh, members as well of, of the National Convention who um, were out of the country, but because of the very short notice, and we all agreed that we needed to have the convention quickly so that we can get back to normal business, the mm -hmm. business of uh, defending the country and fighting against the People's United Party, um, we agreed it would be quick, and so yeah. some people were caught off guard. But it's the summer months, some people travel. Yeah. Let, let's, let's still bring it back to the same point, though, because sure. even if uh, there were change in delegates, change in, in, in the head of the constituencies, you are still seeing a situation where there are more people who don't have confidence in you as a leader 
than you had a year ago? I wouldn't say that to be the case. And I say this again because there, let, me, let, me, let me make the clear example. We had a constituency with six people on their delegation mm -hmm. that don't even reside in the country. Six. There is a situation of one constituency where seven of its voters, seven of its delegates, were not even registered in the constituency. We had situations where we had some of our candidates with their uh, family members. And I don't have a problem with family members participating as delegates if they are truly servants of the constituency. But when uh, colleagues just handpick family members who aren't involved in politics at all mm -hmm. and, and, and stock them on their, on their delegations, that's a problem. And it's not a true reflection of the support that delegates have for any of these candidates in, mm -hmm. in, in a convention. So there, there were many things that were wrong with the selection of the delegates. And, um, and so it's not a true reflection. What for me was a better reflection was me going around the country, mm -hmm. talking to the people of the party and uh, getting from them what exactly they wanted to see. Did they have questions then they about why you were here at this they point? They absolutely had questions. In fact, I sought out those persons who uh, signed the petition mostly mm -hmm. because those who didn't, I assumed, were more likely to support me in the convention. And I wanted to know <laughs> what were the issues. And of course, um, while some in my party made the personal issue that I had a big deal. Um, by and large, when I visited with the delegates, um, while that was used as something to sway them into, into signing, we found many other reasons. We found that people were dissatisfied with the party on a whole. They felt that there was some kind of abandonment. And you will understand that while ultimately the buck stops at the leader, you would hear many of those delegates said, say, I have not even seen my local leader. And so it's a kind of upset with the local leader that, and they want, they want to see some kind of movement in the mm -hmm. party that this is an opportunity for them to re-engage. If we have a convention, then everybody will have to start talking again. Uh, we also saw uh, situations where delegates signed the, 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 the petition because um, their local leaders asked them to do it. Mm -hmm. If five of them are your family members, obviously they will, will sign. Uh, whether or not your position is properly grounded in, in, some, in most cases. And then we had um, situations where people were told were misinformed. They were not told that this is for a recall. And unfortunately, not everybody read uh, the document or whatever was the preamble to, to, this, to the document that they signed. They signed. Um, people were told that I was not calling a National Party Council meeting or have not been calling meetings and so they um, thought that they, they, they told them that once you sign this, uh, the party leader will have to call an, an NPC. And you will understand that an NPC, National Party Council, for the benefit of your viewers, is made up of about 100 plus people. Uh, firstly, in the midst of COVID, <laughs> we cannot have that kind of meeting. It's not the kind of meeting that you want to have on Zoom. Mm -hmm. But also, we don't have a proper constitution for that, for that body. Mm -hmm. And what my colleagues failed to realize is that many of them who did not win especially were not properly placed as, you see, they continue to maintain that they're standard bearers when they're not. A standard bearer takes us into the election. So on the day after the ballots are counted, you cease to be a standard bearer, dependent on uh, what the outcome is. You either become a, an era representative or you become nobody and then the party, your constituency com uh, 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 organization then has to go through the process of selecting a caretaker, which mm -hmm. may be you or may not be you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are the persons who would participate in a National Party Council. With the exception of one of my colleagues, none were, none other were, were, were officially yeah. uh, put in that position of being a caretaker. So strictly speaking, those colleagues should not even have participated in the national convention. What, what I hear from you but is that But if I said that, things would have naturally gotten very worse. What I hear from you is very clearly how you're differentiating the delegates themselves who signed the petition and participated in the vote and who you call your colleagues, the, the caretakers, standard bearers, or uh, represented, era representative, whatever they classify themselves as. But from the outside looking in, it is absolutely clear that your recent 
uh, issue, domestic issue that came to light was really just a tipping point for a problem that existed before. And it appears that very much that your colleagues do not want you to lead the party. You have faced three leadership conventions. We saw, I always tell people, the first convention, it was a snowstorm that delayed that case before the Durman uh, trial ventilated sure. the issue with Saldiva. Sure. And you went back, you were able to be successful, and now you're facing, you faced a recall vote. If that is the case, Marlene, then fine. But there was also a message sent to our party, loud and clear on November 11th, that the people of our party, yeah. and I say our party because the only way the PUP could have won so overwhelmingly was with UDP supporters voting for them. Yeah. So if it is that there is a message coming from my colleagues to me, there was also a message sent from the people of the party and the people of the country to my colleagues to yeah. say they wanted a change. And if I am responding to that change, then I am on the right path. I have said to my colleagues, and I, 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 I deny, mm -hmm. because it's not true, that I ever said to my colleagues, listen, I don't want you to run, or you can't run for this mm -hmm. party, save in those instances where the constitution of our party says that uh, they're not allowed to run, except if they get some kind of um, Honorable Father, special what do break you from, believe the, from to the be NPC. the core issue here? Why do you feel that there is this ongoing attempt to oust you as leader of the party? Well, the primary attempt comes from John Saldiva, who, of course, has sour grapes and, of course, is in a predicament where he needs to self-preserve. Uh, when I refer just now to the constitution of the party, stopping certain individuals from running, he is in that predicament. The constitution says that once you have lost three elections, not, it didn't say... Uh, con consecutive elections, uh, then you have to request special permission from the National Party Council for you to run again. So is that so the John core in, issue that John he's is in concerned that, that you won't let him run again? Well, that is one of his issues, but it is also that, uh, of course, he has ambitions to lead, which he can't do because the Constitution, again, is very clear on who can be leader of the party. So while he will say, I don't want to lead. It is clear that that is an agenda. And then there is the, the point that, okay, so I did not make it. You will not make it either. And then there, there, there are actions to follow that up. And then you have also those people who are, to, to, I can't find a better way to put it, hungry for power. And, of course, they combine with all of these other factors that I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then they agitate. But, you know, I remain focused on what it is uh, people have asked me to do in this party. And that includes uh, those delegates who support me and those who don't support me either. Because when I spoke to them, everybody agrees that the message was loud and clear on uh, election days, November 11th and March 4th, yeah. that we need to redirect this party. And it's just a matter of... Uh, how we do that. The older candidates, the ones who ran in the last election especially, and you know, it's a misconception that all of my colleagues are there. There are about, I'd say about seven or eight who consistently push and are loud, but I had tremendous support from colleagues who did not win uh, in, in, the, in the convention on Sunday. So that's, that's another misconception that people have. But how do you move forward from the process of licking the wounds of this, this, this public debacle to actually uniting the party. You have clear, loud voices still saying that because the majority that participated on Sunday voted no to you being the leader, that you should step down. How do you move forward with we, these persons still involved? We move forward by trying to embrace everybody at first. And by embracing everybody, I don't mean giving in to changing what has been my agenda, which is to uh, present to the people of Belize a party that represents the kind of change that they demanded to see via those elections that we failed. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, moving forward may mean that some of those players are not involved. And it is up to them to decide if they are going to be involved or not. Um, you know. There are, some tough like decisions. there are some tough decisions that have to be made, and that is the case. Look, no matter how you twist and turn it, 
the constitution of our party makes it very quite clear, very clear that I am the leader of this party. Yeah. And you have to respect that authority. Uh, no amount of publications or appearing on television uh, shows change that. Um, I was re-endorsed, you know, and I am a person who supports uh, the movements uh, according to the Constitution. When it was that they said that they had the number of signatures uh, to trigger the, pet the, the, the recall, I said, okay, no problem. And I yielded to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's convenient that we follow the Constitution when it's, when it's convenient, and that has been a practice uh, upheld by the, the last leadership. And I go back to the selection of the yeah. delegates again in Belmopan, in Queen Square. There have never been any conventions. Yeah. Uh, nobody raising their hands and swearing to the oath of the party and swearing to do what they ought to do like in so many others. So a few uh, people who were rogue continued to try to dictate the pace of the party. Let's and because they're loud, uh, they try to give the impression that uh, all is not well. And I think they need to stop. Do they need to stop and now uh, allow us to move forward and fight the true enemy. Do you envision that there will be a point where you draw a hard line and say, you're either with me Absolutely. as a leader? Absolutely. I'm not afraid to do that, but I will employ every tactic, every strategy in order to bring my colleagues uh, together before mm -hmm. we go there. And in fact, that was exactly what I was doing before. I said to them, listen, give me a little chance so that we can uh, try to rebuild the party. The people have said they don't want to see the same faces. Mm -hmm. I appointed a shadow cabinet that tried to, uh, to exemplify just what I've said. Mm -hmm. And some people got upset because of that, you know. Why can't I be in the shadow cabinet? Why can't I be at the forefront when, in fact, be it what it may, the perception was that some of these colleagues ought to leave the party alone. Mm -hmm and uh, make sure that new and fresh faces come about. So that has been my agenda, and some aren't pleased with that. Have and you made any strides in being able to regain the position of leader of the opposition? That is, that is ongoing, and um, today I have some meetings in that direction. There are only three people to convince, right? <laughs> well, it would, uh, it would be a little bit more difficult than that, but I am, meeting so? with, I am meeting with my colleagues because we also have to look at it from a party's position as well. So. Uh, I'm consulting with my other leadership colleagues, um, two of whom are in the, in the parliament, uh, the Honorable Uga Pat and the Honorable Tracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will discuss as well with the party chairman and the vice chairman. So we have a leadership core, which, by the way, is the body that has been making decisions for the party because that is how I operate. Never a dictatorship uh, going on, uh, contrary to what was uh, in the party before my leadership. Uh, the chairman and the vice chairman and the two deputy leaders can tell you. And you'll remember that those two deputy leaders were elected on a Saldiva ticket. Mm -hmm. So they have been working well alongside me. They also signed the, the letter of no confidence to, that was sent to the governor Absolutely, general. Absolutely, which, which is kind of contradictory because they, they shared in whatever decisions that were made. Well, I, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of what we are describing and talking about in terms of the, let's call it the division then between the party, would you say that it is more based on people disagreeing with your vision for the party or is it more something of personal access that people have to grind perhaps with you? You with know, you? I mean, yeah. it's, it's a difficult uh, question because I think it's a bit of both. And I'm not certain which overbears the other because um, there's still quite a bit of feelings from the conventions and I think that while democracy is our primary tenet in this party it sometimes hurts us you know I think nobody can argue with the fact that we have demonstrated to the full extent that we are democratic to the extent that it's killing us uh, those conventions divided the party uh, tremendously and people have uh, feelings and egos that have been bruised and battered and so that continues uh, to to um, extend into where we are today mm -hmm. doesn't help that um, in terms of the victories in the election I won my seat and convincingly did so while my my opponent at the, for, for those conventions did not and lost overwhelmingly so people are battered and bruised 
And so that plays a big role uh, indeed. But uh, it's also a matter of where the party is going to go under my vision that mm -hmm. some people have a difficulty with. Because you see, some can't fit into that vision. A vision of no corruption. A vision of uh, trying to ensure that we represent people more and, uh, and the bases more. You know, that has been my, my, my slogan. It's all about the base. And remember it's also in about moving away from, from some of the stalwarts that have been a part of the party for a long time. I, I know that when you well, speak of needing new blood and fresh faces, that means the old blood and old faces must excuse themselves well, or some, be excused. There are some who may not make it, but it is not my place to say that. Uh, and I take us back to 1998 when the former leader of our party did just that. He told people including John Saldiva, Boots Martinez, Melvin Hulse, Salvador Fernandez. He told all of them, you can't run. John and Boots fought the, the, that, that, that position and they ran. But my point for naming these names is that these, all of these people eventually ran and won, mm -hmm. even though they were deemed at the time to be uh, not viable candidates. So it's not my place to do that, but it is my place to build a party and to put us in a position where people will once again uh, see the UDP as a viable option and um, then to give the opportunity to constituencies mm -hmm. across the country when it is that time for them to select who they want as leaders. And of course, when that time comes, if I feel that any of my colleagues are not the best fit for where we have taken the party, then we will support candidates who we believe fit in that category, but we're not there yet. So let's, let's step back to, to what some have called the, the uh, attempted coup against you within your party sure. and how publicly the conversation has been themed around a character debate um, and looking at uh, the integrity of you as a leader and the issues that have uh, followed you over these years. How do you today, reaffirmed as leader, now tell people of your party and the wider public uh, that you do have the right character and integrity to be the strong leader of the opposition the country needs? Well, I don't know that that has ever been in question. I think that, um, and it is very clear by the kind of comments that you see, uh, even on News 5, mm -hmm. uh, when it is that I am returned as the leader of the party, um, when it is that um, my colleague, who is now the leader of the opposition, makes his post and, and, and makes what uh, many in this party consider to be decisions that are not in our best interest, uh, it is clear that there is that overwhelming uh, support and, and love. And you see, we're always quick to look at the negatives. The truth is the people of the party, the UDP, have voted for me in many respects and demonstrated a love and appreciation in many respects. I was their chairman. They voted for me in 2010 overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. I was their first deputy leader. They voted for me again in 2016. Uh, they voted for me as their leader in 2020. And it is more than the delegates. It is also the overwhelming support that I got from the base of the party everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, the public support everywhere I go. That makes me confident that what you've said uh, is the position, is not the position at all. People uh, see me as somebody that can fill that office mm -hmm. and, and, and adequately fills the office. Can I ask if you were to go back uh, to over a month ago when the, the video uh, of the domestic issue went viral sure. um, and you saw all of these actions that subsequently uh, came from that. What, what, what was going through your mind? Well, to be honest with you, while the personal issue played a role, I think that was something that was pounced on by mm -hmm. those detractors of mine. I feel that, uh, well, we knew that the mm -hmm. movements were already afoot. We saw Saldiva and the caucus for change, so to speak, um, already making movements across the country. By that time, he had already had about four or five meetings in different regions of the country. So I can't say that that the incident of the video and other things uh, added to 
but well, it, it, it gave them an opportunity, of gave course. Gave them a catalyst. But certainly, uh, movements were afoot long before that, and I think that uh, things would have come to a head sooner rather than later. Anyhow, mm -hmm. in, in many respects, it allowed me to um, get to this position because the truth of the matter is what they can say what they, they want to say about the results according to the constitution of this party and according to what they know very well are odds stacked against me the, the people of this party demonstrated on Sunday mm -hmm. that they appreciate and that they love me and that they want me to continue to be the leader and it is for them to fall in line. Now I'm not saying that there is nothing that I can uh, do that will help to try to, you know, there are many lessons learned, in other words. You've spoken of going to therapy and uh, dealing with and learning anger management. What has that process been like for you? And did you always know that you had an anger problem? Well, to be honest with you, I think all of us have anger issues, but there seem to have been situations in particular, especially those having to do with my children, that uh, triggered, and there seems to be a few people who know how to push those buttons very well. So while uh, for me it represented particular situations that I think put me there, um, I think it could not have hurt. And so that seemed, that definitely was an issue, and so I embraced that. And the way I looked at it is that there are other situations, people quite often said, listen, um, you're your passion in your presentations and uh, your arguments sometimes in the house and so on could do with a little toning down. I saw it as uh, passion and, and me putting my all into stuff sometimes and people misunderstanding just where we were going. But my point is that the therapy has been helping all around because it is not just the anger management. Of course, I've mm -hmm. learned how to avoid those triggers and um, that is not something that you just learn either that is something that has to be practiced and uh, made habitual and trust me in all of this it has been exercised many many times i think i have been baptized by fire in terms of that opportunities yeah. those opportunities to practice given all that all the mm -hmm. the, the arrows that have been sh um, shot my way but um you know it also gives me an opportunity to advocate for for um, others to get that help who need it. And, um, you know, one of my delegates said to me uh, when I was down south, he said, you, you know, I agree with you and I understand your situation and everything, but I wouldn't go and tell anybody that I'm getting therapy if I were you because that's not a manly thing to do. And, of course, I, did, I do not agree with that and I, I respectfully disagreed with him. And... Um, you know, many people are in situations where they're not well, mm -hmm. and mental wellness is key. Uh, I, I watch as you all give that quote of the day every day, and you spend dedicated time out of the show every day to uh, ensure that people uh, who may be struggling just, just for a day, just to get that, that little injection of hope for a day, uh, makes a big difference for people. So wellness for me is, is very key, and, and this is not something new that I'm advocating for. It's just that now that my situation has been tossed in the spotlight mm -hmm. and I am getting the kind of support that I need that I think um, others may look to that example and also try to get that support and where I can advocate for uh, whatever issues, domestic violence, um, anger management, mm -hmm. whatever issues are contained in my situation and people look to it for some kind of example and and, 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 and they're reaching out for help, I want to be an advocate and for that. For people who've never had the experience, you know, therapy in itself is a, is a soul-searching experience. There's a lot Absolutely. you have to come to terms with with yourself. Absolutely. What have you learned or discovered about yourself in this process? Perhaps you didn't think you had issues with anger management or you didn't think that there was some kind of aggression that you displayed towards women. What have you come to terms with through this well, experience? Well, the truth is that it, it's 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 a it's a process in the mind as you've mm -hmm. explained and so you don't see a lot of things until you start reflecting um, hurt caused to other people um, is something that and, and you know Jules asked me when I was on on cut if I've started saying I'm sorry to the people apologies. yes you know and and that is something that I've, I've I've been doing because indeed you 
when, when it is you are going through these kinds of situations, you create hurt. And it has caused better relationships uh, on a whole with those who I have engaged with in that, in that respect, primarily the, the, children, the children's mothers, mm -hmm. you know. So um, there's a lot that I've, that I've gained and different perspectives on things. Um, I've come to the realization that I could be calmer in much, uh, much calmer in many situations. I've come to the realization that uh, people appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I've come to the realization that it is not wrong to reach out either and to constantly do reflections on yourself and mm -hmm. try to build yourself to be somebody better. So, so how do you see yourself moving past the hurt of what has taken place in the past month? Because surely, if not personally uh, feeling targeted, it's also uh, a blow to the ego, and you also had to take this time to reaffirm your well, position. you know... There I are hurt feelings, right? There are hurt feelings. And as I've expressed in my interviews uh, on Sunday especially, I try not to harbor uh, hatred. Mm -hmm. And so hurt and hatred um, don't go together for me at all. Um, Speaking about mental wellness earlier, those things are not good. You know, you don't, we, we, I think I can't escape the hurt feelings, but certainly harboring hate and trying to exact some kind of revenge is not what I want to do. And so what I said on Sunday when I gave interviews is genuine. I want to really embrace those. I, I have no ill feeling towards the leader of the opposition, for instance, and mm -hmm. Somebody who I've long told this nation is a good friend of mine, uh, John Saliva. I saw, I saw anguish in him on on Sunday after the results of the yeah. convention it's came quite out. Quite a bit of vitriol you know? coming out. And in fact, I had a I had a therapy session last night, and that was something that I that I spoke with my therapist about because I I, I can empathize. While I've not lost any general elections, and I I can't say that I. I, I, I know what it feels like to lose by that kind of margin, but to be abandoned by people who ought to have given you support, mm -hmm. in your mind at least, um, it, it, it could, it, it's probably very devastating. And then to see that your efforts mm -hmm. um, aren't panning out the way you want it. Um, you know, he lashed out on Facebook. He eventually removed the post that he made and yeah. closed his Facebook page. There must be some kind of anguish going on in there. And so I... I Rather than, than, than hate, I would want us to really come together and, mm -hmm. and embrace each other. I, I feel as well that, because I've, I've observed Shine, I've observed him over time. He goes from one stage to the other stage. Something has got to be wrong as well. Uh, so Did we you have find to it hypocritical that he used a domestic violence issue when he has had uh, claims on his I own? I do, but I don't want to dwell on the negatives, okay. you know. But, but, but the truth is that we all have some kind of issues. In fact, okay. I think that being in leadership is, is very strenuous at times. And I'm sure this is not only for UDP leaders. It's not only for political leaders. It's a strain. And so to behave like all is always well may not be... <laughs> <laughs> the best but, way to handle the, things, you but know. But it's very clear that their attempts have not stopped, as we saw yesterday, they have not where, that where the press release came out, sure. um, speaking on behalf or putting forward a position as the opposition on the 11th Amendment. And you are the party leader of and the you opposing saw they could party. could not use a party letterhead, and this is something that Shine continues to do. It's an appeal that I'm making again today for, for them to stop. Uh, she, uh, Shine has a personal position, and of course, there is a press on him to be uh, very urgent in this matter. It affects whether he will be able to continue. I'm speaking about the 11th Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot force the party into that position, and even if there are others in the party who, ha who has that position. In fact, when you hear me speak of the 11th Amendment, I have never said that I support it or not support it. So to put me in that category, I, I've seen him make positions that everybody else in the parliamentary caucus supports it except the member for Cullet. That's not true because I've never given a position. And all I've said is that I am not in a rush to make a position and neither is the party because while he can speak for his colleagues in... in and, and I, well, I, your I, name is I, on I the letterhead. He put my, my yeah. name yes. up there too. And the truth is that 
Um, I have not given a position, and so that's not a proper representation of me. But I suppose in, if he has indeed polled other parliamentary colleagues who have said that, and you'll know that some of the names on there, they have to pander to him because he's the leader of the opposition. All the senators and one-day senators that are there have to respond accordingly, otherwise we know how he is. You know. Mm -hmm. But, you but know, again, you know, it's not about... You said, you said earlier that you know, you don't hold any grudges. And, sure. But, you know, as things stand now, how do you envision that this dialogue between you and your detractors or your colleagues or you can actually happen? Because it seems like right now, um, this is like a division that can't heal. <laughs> well, it seems that it can't heal. And, and I am hopeful that it will. I am hopeful. I, I cannot not try. And I think that if people see that, that ultimately, um, when the party has to make tough decisions, if we, you know, because if we can't, if we can't resume the unity, then something will break. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I make the appeal for that unity. Um, my colleagues said they wanted a recall convention. That convention happened. You cannot change the goalposts afterwards. My colleague, for instance, Ugo Pat, has said. He will respect the wishes of the party as pronounced by the convention on Sunday. And so I expect him to do the honorable thing and respect that. Um, so we can't change the goalposts after, the, after we, we agreed on the rules, you know, and, 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 and declare a different kind of victory. Um, so I would hope that these things will not continue. Um, I can't say that they won't, but I am going to do my best. You notice that I have not engaged in the neg negative mudslinging. You didn't see a post from me condemning anybody or, or even answering because I don't think that that is healthy for the party. And as I've said, well, I have to face these tough positions. And you're right, they have not stopped in some respects. I have to deal with it as the party leader. But I'm appealing as well for this kind of action to stop so that we can truly unite the party. The people have spoken according to our constitution. Let us move forward uh, and, and fight the common enemy, which is the PUP. Well, you know, and, and, and that's why I want to bring it back to the 11th Amendment, because we have said consistently on this show, what is taking place within the UDP is important, because at the end of the day, the country needs a strong opposition. Absolutely. The 11th Amendment at this time, could it be seen that perhaps not putting forward a position is, it could be dragging your feet? understanding the direct implications to the now leader of the opposition? No, the, the, the truth is that um, while there are some pressing pieces of legislation, I think the Tenth Amendment is far more pressing, and we have had discussions on those, mm -hmm. uh, on that and other bills. Um, we're told that there might be a House meeting next week. Uh, so the 90 days has run out on the, on the Tenth Amendment, I'm sure, although there are is tremendous pressure from our social partners for us not to, 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 to pass the Tenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. But the Eleventh Amendment is not there. You know, the constitution of the country is the supreme law. We, yes. we ought not take it lightly. And there's a reason why they give you that 90-day waiting period for you to thoroughly uh, consider what the proposed uh, amendment is going to do. And my preoccupation with the convention, listen, um, I, make, I made no secret to the leader of the opposition about that. My preoccupation was to try to retain the leadership of the party. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the 11th Amendment certainly was not a priority for me to put on the party's agenda, knowing fully well that we have the time to do so. For him, it's an urgency mm -hmm. because he is caught uh, with this piece of legislation. But that's not a priority for me. Mm -hmm. But we will get to it. We have to have a party's position. Um, we're looking at new ways, in fact, of engaging uh, the leadership of the party. Um, the National Convention, as you know, is the chief decision-making yes. body of the party. Um, the National Party Council is the second highest body. And these bodies may need to chime in on where we see this, especially in light of the, the fact that it affects so, so desperately one of our, one of our top 
parliamentarians, well, not that we have many, no? so I guess all of us are top. <laughs> so when you look at, at how um, things have played out over the past week, we had uh, clearly uh, Shine Barrow as the leader of the opposition being very vocal. We've seen the online discourse taking place. We've seen Senator Darrell Bradley stepping forward, and he made no, um, he had always said that eventually he does want to seek leadership. How do these people now play a role in the United Democratic Party you see but moving they, forward? They've always been invited to play a role. And that's another thing that I think people need to, to, to know, you know. But it's um, hard for people to believe or to be convinced that you will be able to work closely along with people who visibly made an attempt to try to get you out of your well, position. Well, I, again, I do not harbor ill feelings. I will embrace everybody, but there are situations that have been made wrong because mm -hmm. of the hastiness and the kind of leadership that, that the Honorable Shine Barrow has demonstrated. I, I, I don't think that that's an unfair categorization because it is plain everybody says this on all your social media platforms. You see this loud and clear. People are not happy with the direction in which, it, in fact, it is one of the reasons that I was able to garner the kind of support that I got for the convention because people are not happy with these, Jules Vasquez called it, uh, his mercurial uh, character. It's not stable. And people want to see the leader of their party as the leader of the opposition as well. So there can only be uh, a position of following what the party wants. Um, there can't be an individual agenda, and I remind my colleagues who are in the House that their mere presence in that House is because of the United Democratic Party. There must not be, there ought not be a different agenda by a few in the Parliament that does not follow the agenda of the party, because that is very dangerous waters. And we can't just go rogue. I mean, there are yeah. positions that we have to follow, but getting back to what you were what you were asking me in, part, in particular, there are some erratic decisions that have caused waves and uh, those wrongs, uh, as the party sees fit, may have to be righted once things change. And I make no apology for that. So if there's a house meeting with the, within the next week and a half, do you imagine you'll be seated in the house as leader of the opposition? Well, it is the wish of the party that that is so. And so we will Is work. that the campaign you're working on we at will. this time? Absolutely, I'm working on that. And you feel that you'll be successful? Well, I, I don't work at things to fail. <laughs> All right. Any closing <laughs> thoughts? Put it that way. Well, I, I just want to make a final appeal. Well, it's not a final appeal, but a final appeal on this show um, for those who are detracting from the unity of the party at this time to uh, let's come together, let's shape things up. Um, the party's position has been made known very clear on Sunday. Uh, I'm the leader of this party, and so I make the embrace, extend the arms of love and friendship mm -hmm. uh, to all who uh, want to see this party succeed. I especially make that appeal to my friend and my colleague, my one-time friend, John Saldiva, and to, and to Shine Barrow. You know, who up to now have not called to congratulate me? They're mm -hmm. poor. You know, people like to say that Faber is vindictive and spiteful. Mm -hmm. But every time that I have lost a convention, you've never seen me uh, be a brat or condemn the party. Every time in 2013 when I lost, in fact, I was the chairman of the party at the time. I had to go back on the stage and finish the convention, congratulate the winners. In 2020 when I lost, I didn't go into hiding because that is who I am. I am a UDP and I love this party to death and nobody's going to have me leave. Uh, so I, 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 I extend the olive branch and I say to my colleagues, let us unite this party. But I also want to thank the delegates who participated, all of them, whether they uh, voted for me or not. I think the party's uh, democratic principles and tenets were on full display mm -hmm. um, on Sunday. Even though the turnout was not 100 percent, it is still a very high turnout for a national convention. And in the, in the midst of all the chaos and, and confusion that the party is in, the democratic principle still stood firm on Sunday. So we thank all of those delegates mm -hmm. and we thank all those who wish the party well and, of course, want to see us succeed.
All right. Thank well, you guys for having me. Thank you for thank coming you for in and me. having this conversation. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to be demystifying the COVID variants. What's the difference with the new variants being detected and what's the risk it poses to you? That's coming up after the break, so stay tuned.